All right. So I just thought it'd be so fun to do this intention together and in a more public manner. Usually we do these beforehand at a record. I'm like, nope, I want to share this intention. Dr. Amanda Hansen, you are amazing. My friend, goddess woman, I'm so psyched to be here with you. And uh, we're just going to put our hands to our heart and call in divine wisdom, intelligence, and ask that this conversation be guided and led for the highest good of all the ears that are tuning in all over the world. And that anyone and everyone who is listening and part of this conversation comes away feeling even more connected to their divinity, their heart, and what I call your USGU. And is there anything you would like to add? I too would like to send that same frequency out into the world that every heart and mind is just expanded and open from this conversation. And that every human listening feels an invitation into a deeper part of their magnificence. Beautiful. And so it is. Yay. All right. Well, I am so excited. This is so fun to have you here. And I'm going to introduce for all of my amazing, brave dreamers, heart-led leaders, my USU family, soul sisters and brothers. I'm so excited you're here. This is going to be a really, 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 I know, juicy and heartfelt conversation. And I want to share with you, we are Grace today with our incredible guest, Dr. Amanda Hansen, who is a clinical psychologist turned transformational life coach for women. Her brand, Revolutionizing Midlife, is all about redefining and reclaiming what it means to be a woman who is 40 plus. And she is self-proclaimed uh, in this paradigm, sh- self-proclaimed paradigm shifter. And her contagious approach is one of the limitless possibilities When you get to hear from Dr. Amanda yourself, you are going to feel like you are in a land, a world of infinite possibilities. And that is one of my hopes for today. Where most see roadblocks, she sees opportunities. I love that. And I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I feel like we can like dive right in. I'm so excited. (laughs) Yes, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here as well. Yay. All right. Well, I, let's start with, you know, and I know some listening may not be in midlife. Some might be even a little past it. Um, I do know quite, quite a few of our listeners just from the responses and feedback I get can, can, uh, you know, relate to this midlife 40 plus kind of genre. Um, what made you decide to focus on this, you know, this population, this age group, I'd love to hear like your story a little bit. What, what, what made you focus on it? What was the impetus behind really deciding this is where you want to spend your energy and your time and your alignment? Yes, that's a great question. I think that so often societally, we are talking to young children about what they want to become when they grow up, what they're going to go to college and study. And then they get into the world and there's still this huge expanse of dreaming kind of palette that our early teens, 20s, even 30s can be comprised of. And as someone who's always been a dreamer, who's constantly reinventing myself and evolving, as I was approaching midlife, I felt like there were less conversations around what it means to still be dreaming. I mean, really dreaming and creating. I had the sense as I kind of looked around and the information that I was finding, particularly if you Google midlife before I finished the word midlife, the Google search finished it for me and it was midlife crisis. Mm. And I started to feel like, wait a minute, I am so on fire. I am so excited for this time in my life. Why aren't more people talking about this? And so in my own kind of research at the time, my market research, I started to realize there wasn't anybody talking or putting emphasis on, particularly for women, which is really my specialty, this reinvention, reclamation, rejuvenation, reimagining. It was a lot of the temperature and storyline was such that the good years are over. Now you're just going to kind of get through and your youth has been, you know, oh gosh, I wasted my youth or I wish I looked like I did when I was 20. I wish my body didn't ache the way it, it, you know, used to function so much better. It was a lot of 
looking back over the shoulder for years that were gone. And I am such a believer of living so presenced in my life that I thought, I, I can't be the only woman who really wants to presence this midlife experience, take it really by like both arms, wrap my arms around it and, and create something and live, rediscover my relationships, rediscover, or possibly even really discover for the first time, my body, my love, mm. build self-trust. Like I'm doing things in the last decade. I'm about, I'm going to be 50. I'm doing things in the last 10 years, Julie, I had no even language for. So I don't want women to miss out on what is possible if we start to look at midlife and beyond through this lens of opportunity and expansion. Mm, gosh, you are, th this is really important and really powerful. And as, as someone who, as a, as a woman who certainly I'm, I'm over 40, um, you know, there's not much out there that is framing it this way. I mean, you know, I've asked myself these questions, like th those que big questions, like how might this be helping me to be wiser? How am I going to do even, how am I even more connected to who I am now? Mm -hmm. And I will say like, there's not much to really reflect back that this could be some of the most incredible time. In fact, the way I'm hearing you is if you're really present, you know, then you're, then it's like, we always have the opportunity to grow and expand always. And I think in midlife, at least this has been my experience and many of my clients experience. One is that there is a sense of time urgency. Yeah. You know, the reality that if all goes well, I'm halfway through. So there's one piece around that, but there's another piece, at least for me. And again, I've seen this with a lot of my female clients is there comes a deep level of respect for self and this this frame of life that kind of lends to there's no more time for bs not in people not in the way i talk to myself not in the way i move in the world not the systems and company that i keep where i put my money i think it's a really great time to metaphorically like clean house as well and really come home to ourselves in a way maybe we were too busy getting the career raising a family trying to figure out who we were when in fact, I'm like, oh my gosh, 40s and beyond is where I'm really figuring out who I am. Mm, mm, well said. Yeah, I, I it, it, it's not. This is not like the norm. I don't, I don't hear this, and I think it's so important. I mean, one thing I want to ask you about, just again, being a woman in my mid to later 40s, you know, there's there's hormonal changes. There's all kinds of like mm -hmm. shifts happening, and it's interesting. I remember when I was. Um, you know, in the stages of having my kids and it, it felt like so much energy and education was around like how not to get pregnant, how to get pregnant, how to have your babies, how to make sure your body goes back. And literally it's been like crickets, like what, you, there's nothing like nothing, even, even going to my, and I have a pretty, you know, an integrative based, you know, um, OB. And it's like, there's not much information about what happens next. Well, think about that. What you're saying, Julie, I love that you brought up this point. Like if we really dissect this, the money typically goes to in researching, right. In the medical medical world, money is really put into places that matter that we really care about. And not to be totally crass, but the reality, I don't think we really, as a general population, care a lot about a woman who is no longer fertile. Yeah. And I've interviewed two OBGYNs on my podcast, and both of them separately told me, without me even prompting or asking, that when they were going through their OB training and rotations, that there was almost nothing, no discussion on female sexuality pleasure, desire, lubrication, and, or anything post fertility years, like nothing. Mm. They're like, so we literally, one of the women, her, she ended up opening a, a practice for women who were in, entering menopause and beyond in Houston, because as she went through it, she thought, I cannot believe for 20 years, women have been coming in seeking help. And I've not known what to tell them. I've been writing them a prescription for some like hormones or some bioidenticals or antidepressant. Like there's been no way to actually speak to them because no one was trained for it because it's not valued. Women who are aging are not valued. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to put the money into the research to figure out how to give them an optimal 
functioning. We're worried about how are we going to keep the younger women either not getting pregnant or getting pregnant. Okay. What you just said, I think we need to go back to that. Cause that is really that statement. I was like, okay, well this, this is changing this whole women who are aging are not valued. I think there is, you know, truth today in that hundred percent. And that it, I'm like, oh heck no, not on my watch. <laughs> not on my watch, Julie. And I think that's <laughs> also, watch. I think that's also why we see so many women trying to attain their youthful appearance. Yeah. You know, I, I know that the Botox is starting as young as 20 now. And girls are saying things like, this is my kids who are in college are reporting to me that their friends are saying things like, well, I'm doing it to be preventative. And I say to my kids, preventative of what? Yeah. Everyone, as far as last time I checked, the marker for success in your life is you're still aging. You're still alive. Yeah. And so I'm not sure what we're trying to prevent, but the fact this is like roll off the tongue language now, I'm doing it to be preventative, meaning before I show any signs of aging. So now we're all just going to be frozen and we're going to fight any signs of our mortality yeah. because the fear, the fear of, and our youth obsessed culture yeah. is so we're all, we're all so fearful of it. And the way I'm trying to move through my life, and I feel like I am moving through my life with me first, family, obviously, and in clients is that there's two choices as far as I see it and the way we choose to live our lives. You can choose fear or you can choose love yep. every time for every single thing. And I'm choosing love first and foremost for myself. I'm not choosing fear that I'm aging. I'm choosing love for my humanity. I'm choosing mm -hmm. love for the spiritual process that I get to witness every morning in the mirror when I see another line, another sunspot, another silver hair. I am choosing to love her. Mm. That's a revolution in itself, Amanda. <laughs> it feels like it. Yeah, no. And, you know, you said this, the, the word that popped out a minute ago is, you know, that, and I know even my daughter who's 15, she's not asked to get Botox, but she's made comments and like, you know, and trying to like, oh, does my skin look, I'm like, you're beautiful. And like, what do you, what, like this, this preventing from something. And you said the word fight. It's this fight. And I got to tell you, it's the same fight to me. I don't want to fight anything. We don't want to fight anything. Fight comes under fear. So yes. love what yes. you said. It is love or fear you choose. And I think it's a revel. I think it's revolutionary and I think it's courageous. And I think it's a, a stand I'm with you on that. I, um, I've decided I, I, I've been a fan of Louise Hay way like in the early days. I used to, I was raised by a mom. <laughs> Who had Love. me look in the mirror and hug myself, you know, the Stuart Smalley SNL skit. That was my mom. And <laughs> listening to her, you know, these affirmations. And I just like what you're saying, looking at yourself and saying, like, damn, you are wise. You're beautiful. Like really honoring who you are using, you know, I believe in that and the power of just, but not from that place of it's got to change. It's like, you know, I remember my grandma with her smile lines. I thought it was so beautiful because oh, yes. she had smile lines from smiling. Yes, it's so true. And there's even early research right now that is showing that when women have Botox in their forehead and around their eyes, it's literally because everything is frozen, they are not able to mimic. When we, when I am having an interaction with you, I am reflecting and mimicking back much of your emotion. I'm feeling yeah. your joy, your pain, right? We are, we are a mirror for one another as we are having a reciprocal relationship. But when your face is frozen, they're now showing studies that say that that the dopamine is not being released in the brain when you're not able to mimic the emotion back. Mm. And so you're not feeling as connected and they are not feeling as connected to you because they can't see the emotion on your face. Wow. 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 Does that have to do with even mirror neurons? Like you can't mirror what you're seeing. I wonder if that's part of it too. That is it's so brand new. And so I'm, I'm so interested to keep learning and reading more, but it's brand new cutting edge research showing like the yeah. inability to relate on the same level with humanity when you, because that is part of how we relate. We reflect yeah. back the pain on your face. I feel it on mine and I show you, I'm listening. I'm here. I'm, I'm witnessing you. But when we're not able to express with our facial expressions, right. the person across from us doesn't feel the same level of connection to us, nor do we to them. Yeah. And I think it's important, you know, I, I know 
our listeners all over the world, some may have, like, it's not a bashing thing here about Botox. However, what I think the thing I love what you're saying so much is just really like, what's the root of it all? What is the root? Are you mm-hmm. coming from fear? Or are you coming from love? I, that's what I'm hearing. And mm-hmm. how can we start shifting this conversation, which I would love to talk about. I know before we started, you were sharing that you have recently also gotten into the TikTok world and that you put a video together that, that just traveled the globe many times over and really, really talking about this, um, you know, toxic beauty culture and the double standard. And I'd love to get into that. Cause I, I think it needs to be like aired out, you know, it's like stale and like mold, like we need to air this shit out. So we really do. <laughs> I love this. It's very moldy and, and just needs very to- moldy. <laughs> this idea. Like, come on people. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think for me, it was a clip of a recording that I had, um, done for something else, but it was essentially this conversation I was having with someone in regards to the double standards of aging and how there is not even a thought, like my husband's six years older than me. And as he was entering his mid forties, early fifties, I don't ever remember once him having a thought, a conversation, a concern, a worry about the gray in his beard, on his head, the thinning of his hair. Like, I don't remember that being a moment of even notice, let alone the frantic energy I was watching so many women around me, friends and family, and even my own mother reflect um, in the aging process. Mm-hmm. So I really started to think about this a couple of years ago, like, and I, I got a little bit like miffed by it. Like, I want to go through my midlife journey, not even wor- like being excited if I see a silver hair or a wrinkle, not trying to cover it all up. So it began this whole conversation. And the video that went viral was one where I talked about the, the moment that I decided to stop coloring my hair. It's one of those moments. I don't even know what prompted it. I don't know what happened. I, I had been thinking about it for several months prior to this moment, but I was in the hair salon getting my hair, you know, my grays covered, which I was then at that point going every two to three weeks Mm. to cover up the grays. And I remember at one point looking up while the process was in my hair, I kind of looked up and I scanned the room and everyone was on their phone. All the women were on their phone or on their reading magazines. And my first thought was it's all women. My second thought was, what are we doing here? Mm. Like, what are we actually doing here? Yeah. This feels like some kind of assembly line. And then the other piece was like, what I kept hearing over and over was, we're like a bunch of objects, Mm. like a a bunch of decorations. And that was the point at which I was like, I, I'm done. I'm done spending my time. I'm done spending my money and I'm done risking my health by putting these chemicals on top of my head. Like, what am I doing? I have been eating organically. I exercise. I take good care of myself. I teach my kids about healthy living. How can I turn around and put poison into my body and call it good in the name of what? In the name of beauty? Because I'm just as beautiful no matter what color my hair is. So that was the moment I decided. And I came home and I, I announced it at the kitchen counter. And my husband and, and one of my sons, at the, he was 17 at the time, they were sitting there. And my husband looked up and he said to me, are you worried that you're going to look washed out? And I said, no, but clearly you're worried about that. Mm -hmm. And so then it began this really fascinating conversation about, did, did you question if you were going to look washed out when you started going gray? And then it had this moment of pause and like, oh my gosh, you're right. And so we, we still talk about it all these years later, we have these fascinating conversations about it. But um, my son who was 17 at the time looked up because he's, been raised by me, (laughs) looked up and he said, mom, you are going to rock it. Mm. And through the lens of, you know, he's been raised, he's 20, almost 22. Now he's been raised to, to see opportunity and beauty everywhere. So he just sees the world that way. And actually uh, this past Christmas, when he was home, I made a comment about like, this, I don't even know how I said something about, oh yeah, this is like the new thing that's popped up in my life, this big sunspot. It's going to be like my third eye. That's what I was saying. Like now I'll be able to have like another eye on you everywhere you go. We were laughing and he looked at me and he like really looked at me close. He goes, oh mom, it's so cool. And I'm like, who is this child? 
Yeah. <laughs> Mom, you're going to rock your silver hair. Your sunspots are so cool. I'm like, I think they are too, babe. And so I think it's always the lens through which we decide to see something. If I decide to see the wrinkles as old aging haggard, or I can see the wrinkles as every time I've laughed, every time I've cried, every time I've been in the sun on an island somewhere with my family, mm -hmm. I get to decide what I want to make it mean. I make it mean love. Mm, there you go. That That is the, uh, the shout out right there is decide mm -hmm. what, what it means and you make it, I make it mean love. There you go. And that's, that is really, you know, I think we talk a lot about like changing thoughts and beliefs and how to do it. I think this topic is probably one of the hotter, more, Ooh, it's got a lot of, a lot around it because of the double standards. I mean, and you, you, you know, like bless your husband and you know, it's like, I, I but like Julie, I here's the really cool thing, yeah. right? So he was, he was, and he'll, he will admit to this day when I first made that declaration, he was trepidatious because yeah, his wife who's six years younger than him is all of a sudden going to look like in his mind, was it like, is she going to look tired? Is she going to look haggard? Is she going to look old? Whatever he thought, who knows? But in the last couple of years, when we've been almost anywhere and it's really sunny out, He'll say to me, babe, go ahead a little bit. I want to take a picture of the way the sun is hitting your hair right now. Cause in the right light, it is like snow white. Mm -hmm. So I'll walk ahead and he's like, oh my gosh, it looks amazing. He's so in awe of it now because I showed him yeah. through loving myself yeah. in the process, what it looks like to love somebody. I'm still the same woman. There's no fear. I'm not old now. My spirit is young as it's ever been. I've just decided to, to honor the natural because for me, it is a spiritual process yeah. and I don't want to deny one piece of it. Mm, that's the thing. That's it right there. I mean, I think what you're really, it's, that's the crux of it is, and this really makes me think about for, for all of us who are doing this work to, I know for me, stop abandoning yourself. Right. And that means loving the parts, all of those parts. Yes. I think that's very, very much important, even in that integration work, right? Like loving all aspects of your body. I, I struggled with body image for a long time until I gotta tell you, having two babies back to back, I was like, damn, I don't, I'm not even looking at what's folded or rolled here. I don't care. I'm like the cells in here, the trillions of cells are badass. Like I've just, right. You know, I mean, there are moments I'll be honest, like there are moments I'm like, oh, okay, that looks a little different. All right. All right. I'm go with it. And I'm curious, you know, because body image and then of course double standards and then the way media portrays, especially, I mean, everything from you see women that have had babies, especially celebrities, all of a sudden they're right back to where they were, or there's this, you know, frankly, a lot of the women that do do the work on their face. And it just gives this, this idea that you know, aging, it's like, no, 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 you don't age. You're not. And, and I love this reframe. I yeah. love this reframe where I'm just, what I'm wondering is for somebody listening who may not be where you are yet may feel mm -hmm. like, you know, I am not there yet with my body or I'm seeing some, what do you call them? I, don't, I mean, wrinkles, but like the fear, I don't know. There's like names for these lines. My, <laughs> I don't even know. I don't like, know either. Are there, like, are there like pre wrinkle terms now? I don't even know. <laughs> your fear of brow or I don't know. I know like, I mean, smile lines, like some of these words, you know, you're seeing that or you, it, I just, what I actually do is I ignore all, I just ignore it. I, I look at my eyes instead. I, I just, mm -hmm. I don't know if ignoring is the right way to do it, but I'm like, let me not look there. Let me look at like, you know, my mm -hmm. eyes. Let me look at other things. What would you say though, to someone who is not where you are yet and they're, still feeling, you know, there's a lot of pressure and there's maybe feeling not good enough, or there's things they want to change. And it doesn't feel like, you know, maybe a little fear, a little bit of shame. What would you, where do you start? Mm, such a great question. I would say that ultimately, you know, I do do morning affirmations. I, I like to put on my most loving jacket, if you will, before I enter the world, before I turn on my phone, before I go out into the world, before I hear something about another product trying to be sold by a woman, right? So one of the things I do is I begin my day with a morning affirmation in the mirror. It's so simple. I just tell myself, good morning, beautiful. I know. Now I also do this with really steady eye contact. Like I really bore into my own eyes. And I say it with presence and intention. And I say, good morning, beautiful. I love you. You are a goddamn miracle. 
And I allow those words to wash over me because what I'm doing is I'm reprogramming my nervous system and my cellular structure for a culture and a world that has told me I'm not beautiful. I am not worthy. I'm disposable. I'm old. I'm not as fun to look at as I was 20 years ago. So I am recoding the messaging. And then from that energy, I move about my world. And when I show up into a room, that's why I radiate. I don't radiate because of others glances or messaging. I radiate because I filled myself up with all that beauty first. And I have a squeaky clean, exquisite mindset, squeaky clean. I don't allow any trash to to enter. Mm -hmm. So my social media is so clean. Like my social media is only beauty, inspiration, nothing toxic beauty culture. Nobody who's using, I I won't even follow women who use filters. That's how far I've gone. Like I don't follow women. If you can't show me your real face in a conversation, I I wouldn't buy anything from you. I wouldn't hire you. I, I, I don't even trust you, to be honest. That is not an art form for me. That is hiding. How could I ever buy something from someone who can't even fool. I only want real. Give me as raw as you come. So I keep such a squeaky, squeaky clean mindset and what I take in to my brain that it makes it so easy to maintain this kind of living. Like I actually truly don't even understand the brain power it must take and how much it must drain a battery to have your social media or your friendship circles or what you uh, consume even on Netflix or in any, any places or spaces in the world that are opposite. I don't, I don't even have, um, a bandwidth to understand how you, how you handle all that. Oh it, it's so exhausting. I can imagine. Yeah. A, a F and men girl, amen. Or a them I've heard is another way to say it. A them. Yes. yes. <laughs> a woman, a woman, a, uh, all the things, all the things you, I, I just, <laughs> we're obviously doing this virtually and I just have to, I'm laughing. I get visuals. Sometimes my inner little voice is audible today right now is visual. And I literally saw myself jump out of my box in the zoom and like <laughs> run over and give you the biggest, biggest hug ever. And I'm like, speak it out, preach it woman. This is really, really, this is it. This is having a squeaky clean mindset. And I, I'm like, I would say I have a clean one. I have a clean one. I'm going to, I'm like, shit, I'm going to make mine squeaky clean. That's what I'm going to start working on. But you know, I, it's funny. I was watching last night. Um, I actually found like TV that, um, I say, I, I say that I microdose TV. It's what I do. I love it. I love <laughs> and, it. And I, I found this during the pandemic. I realized actually having the right kind of shows that are really high vibe and that, that, that are just like heart centered. Um, mm. so I was watching, I love goop a lot. I, 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 I do too. Huge fan. I was watching sex, love and goop last night. Yes. And what I loved was first of all, these, these couples of all backgrounds, orientations, ages, you know, and I'm only on, I think the second episode, but you know, just, and, and the, the beautiful, uh, experts who, who deal and connect with sexuality and sensuality, sizes, shapes, gray hair. It just, it was like, mm. thank you, Gwyneth and T. Te- thank you for right. really like, it's what I'm hearing you say. And it, it just feels more grounded and real. And it's like, you know, why are we using all of these things that are not true? They're not authentic. It's, you know, whether it's a filter or, um, just, you know, having to be a certain way where you're not feeling like you can be fully self-expressed. That's, I know the whole point of what I stand for with this whole idea of being your USU, it's like, hello. And the USU, it's like, it's not one stagnant aspect. It's not stuck at 23. You're, no. you're it's growing. It's expanding every day. I mean, look at nature. I mean, nothing, it, it, it's actually weird. If you actually think about it, I'm sure you've thought about this. If you look at mother nature, I think about it as our greatest teacher. Look at nothing. Nothing is like, you know, formaldehyde, like frozen in time unless it's frozen and okay maybe in antarctica it's frozen but who really you know frozen not a lot lives in frozen Mm. (laughs) oh my gosh that's such a fabulous analogy i use the analogy of mother nature all the time the ebbing the flowing the evolution the death the growth 
it, the transformation, like that's what I'm here for. Give that to me. That's what I really want to be in the journey of and in the celebration of, you know, it's interesting because I love what you're saying about the goop. I, I watched the sex love goop series. I loved it so much. And for all the reasons that you're speaking to in the same way that I love the way ever so slightly, I know we still have a long way to go, but how the modeling industry is changing, right? With, yes. with able-bodied and transgender and different colors and shapes and all of the things. But do you know the one thing we're still not seeing? Mm. We're not seeing older women. It's a very oh, yeah. rare time you will see an aged woman who it, men, you'll see them all the time. You'll see the men with the gray beards all in the modeling. Mm. And they're standing next to a woman that you could probably be her daughter but it's supposed to be his lover, right? So if pay attention, we still don't see, which I think is fascinating mm. because Julie, it's the one thing yeah. that every human will experience. And yet we're trying to pretend it doesn't exist for women. It's a success if it happens to a man, he's more distinguished, more yes. revered. He's a silver fox. He's so sexy. If it happens to a woman, if she dares to be human, she's punished. Got chills. A, uh, I was just wrote the word distinguished. It's so true with a male. That is absolutely, it, it's a hundred, the words, the, you know, it's looked at as um, you're, you're, you've made it like you're at this, like, I almost feel like you get this like trophy of look at you that the stink, exactly the revered distinguished. You're right. And it is complete. And what word do we have for women? Hag, spinster. Yeah. yeah. Grandma. I yeah. I don't even know of a word that is in reverence crone. I mean, I'm, I'm reviving the word crone because I love it, yeah. you know, and some of the work that I do with women, we talk about it in some of my spaces, I talk about, okay, so there was this time in your life where you imagined yourself in your twenties, you imagine yourself in your thirties and forties, maybe even your fifties. Tonight's assignment is we are all going to take a few minutes and we are going to close our eyes and we are going to cultivate and imagine the 80 or 90 year old version of you. What is she doing? What wisdom does she carry? Where does she live? How does she move? What does she look like? Tell me about her. Let's invent and fall in love with her because I think it's so incredible. I have a very distinct vision of who I will be, who I'm crafting right now to become her. I'm in the training path to be her. And I love that it's, it's still in the dreaming phase. It's still in the cultivation. It's still like, I can't wait to be her. I'm on the journey to her. I think that we give that up. We stop doing that at a certain age. And we think that that dreaming is only for the young. You dream of the day, which is so ridiculous, but uh, so many girls dream of the day they're going to wear their wedding dress or dream of the day they become a mother. It's like always in relation to somebody else. It's like, how about we dream? Like, who do you get to be yeah. as this crone woman in the world? I just, oh my gosh, do I resonate? It's very interesting. It's, it's so funny you say this. I, I do a lot of visualization and it was about a year ago. I had this image. I could see, I had this, I could see myself in my late seventies, early eighties. I still have it. And you know what? I, I was like, I love the feeling. I actually was like, mm. damn, I am not people pleasing at all in that stage, which I'm working on, you know, some of the things, patience, like pre I was like, I am so present. I can see and feel, I can see it. And I, um, the word that came to me was like this wise elder. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's something, well, we could go in way into this, but I think when we <laughs> obliterated the indigenous cultures here, I think we, we've lost what is so revered, mm -hmm. um, in, in, in indigenous cultures. And, and, and frankly, you know, I, I like, pray that everyone listening, that you and I, that I know you're on this mission, we, we reclaim that we bring that, that wisdom back. I mean, wisdom, you don't buy wisdom. Wisdom doesn't happen until you have that time on earth and experience it's, mm. it's, it's earned by, you know, the steps you're walking and by the, the smiles and the cry, like all of it, it doesn't happen yes. overnight. You can't, you know, you might have a blue check mark next to your name on Instagram. That doesn't mean you're wise. And that, not nothing oh. against that, but <laughs> it does a million percent. Yes. And you can have a blue check mark and be wise. I know there's, there's some, yes. wise, some yes. wise, you know, I think Oprah's in there. Like I would look at her and my Angelou, I think of like women like that, who I'm like, 
Damn, that is, that's who I am. Like my version of that, please. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What I think, you know, so for those listening, I just keep coming back to that don't have the squeaky mindset yet that are, you know, what I'm imagining is there's like an awakening process, right? You may not even realize the culture. I think most listening will have realized like we're in this, you know, this, this toxic beauty culture and this double standards. How can we start like shifting things within ourselves? And I love the morning affirmation. I love that I do something similar, but I'm actually going to try your version because I really love just Mm -hmm. watching you and hearing you say that. What other things have you done or do you see in working with your clients that have helped to kind of just change the way someone can start to feel and see about themselves? I love this question. I think really what it begins with is instead of having your gaze be up and out, looking for the world to affirm you, give you praise, accolades, you know, standing ovations, it is starting learning how to cultivate a life that looks within and starts to say, like, I, I was even talking about this in one of my TikTok videos. Um, I got some photos back of me from a recent photo shoot in Miami. And some of the photos I looked at and my initial reaction to a few of them, where you could really start to see like the aging on my neck, the initial reaction for me was, oh, what, what is that? Oh my gosh. Like it was one of the first photos I actually saw the signs of it. And I had to sit and say, okay, Amanda, where is that coming from? Do you actually think that is ugly or have you been trained and conditioned and programmed to believe that's ugly? And then I allow myself to really get embodied and really like sit with it and then look at it again and I can find the beauty if I allow myself to, but I will tell you the way I've chosen to live, Julie, is not, it's not a flick of a switch. It is not an easy process. It is an intentional, deeply embodied way to live. I have worked my ass off to get to this way of being. This is not like, oh, I'll say some affirmations in the mirror and we'll all be good. This is for people listening. I just want to presence that because I don't want you to feel you're doing it wrong. If you try some of these things, you're like, oh, it didn't work. Because I am working against hundreds and thousands of years of conditioning for, towards women to be objectified. It's ancestrally coded inside of me. My mothers and grandmothers lived to please men, to look a certain way. So I'm not just undoing it for me. I'm undoing it for all the women who came before me in my lineage. So it takes work. It takes time. I didn't get to almost 50 years of believing certain things about women and think that I'm going to change that in a couple of affirmations in a couple of mornings. So this is deep, profound work. And I will say it is only for those who are willing. Mm. You have to be willing. I wanted it so bad, Julie. I wanted and believed as an old soul, as a little girl who at even five years old, when my family tells stories about my five-year-old self, I had such an old, old soul then. As a woman who living the other way felt like an affliction, like trying to fit into this beauty culture world and do all the things felt like I was literally annihilating myself. And I felt like I had to do it because it was the only way to be a woman in the world. And so when I finally broke out of it, I decided like, oh my gosh, this is, this is actually me. So it's, it's back to the question. It's like always, if you feel like, oh my gosh, this role, oh my gosh, this thing, you have to then ask yourself, do I actually believe that? Or have I been conditioned to believe that? And then if you allow in just enough fury just enough rage. You can then at the beginning, I needed some of that because then I made it a game like, Oh no, 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 no. Oh no, no, no. Consumer culture, capitalism. You are not going to get the best of me. How dare you tell me I have to do a certain thing to be acceptable. As a matter of fact, I won't only do the opposite. I'm going to like help other women learn how to do the opposite. I am not going to open my handbag to one more toxic thing, one more toxic item, because think about if the amount of money and hours we spend, I had a client recently add up, she spends eight hours a week in her maintenance. If she took that time, that money, imagine what she could create and do in her life. Mm, Yeah, just, and that, that compounds, you know, that's, that's like 
getting there, the money, the investment, the energy, the thinking about it, that's eight. I mean, that, that, that adds up to a lot of time. That could be a book. That could be a movement. <laughs> it could be making love. That could be yeah. uh, sitting out in the sun. It could be, I don't know. It could be so many things. It could be going for a walk in nature without your phone. It could be living. Yeah. And so it's, it's so individual. We, you, and I think what it boils down to is you just, this is for people who are really willing to break out and want to live more free. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is so, this is spot on, Amanda. And I think what you said is true. It's, it's, um, it's really, you've got to be willing. And I do think, and you know, we're, we're recording this in a time of that spring energy. It's funny that, that little mm-hmm. bit of anger, fury, I, I you know, it, it's an actually a healthy emotion and energy, just a, just a bit. It's like just sparingly. And I think you're absolutely right. It's funny. I was, uh, for those listening, you probably can't see this, but I always ask before I do an interview, I kind of ask me under guidance, like, what should I wear today? And it's funny. I'm like, all right, I heard to wear my sweatshirt, which I don't usually wear. And it says, nevertheless, she persisted. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no wonder this is what we're talking about. Like, nevertheless, even though there's been hundreds of years and beyond crazy amounts of conditioning and programming that you probably not, we're not even aware of, you know, you Mm. persisted, she persisted. And I love that about you. I think it's so inspiring. And I'm hoping everyone listening, whether you are female, identify as female, know a female, (laughs) know a woman, like supporting yourself and others to just to be fully self-expressed. And you said it, it's about being free Mm. and, you know, and are you coming from love or fear? That's really that bottom line question. And I know this is the work you're meant to do. You do this with clients and retreats in your podcast and your work. I think it's, it's so needed and the time is ripe. It's right now. Mm. Yes. Thank you so much. You know, another one thing I wanted to share was I was just thinking about a friend of mine and he's from the Congo. His wife um, had their second baby a couple of years ago and he and I were having this conversation. He's like, you know, I'm really fascinated. He and I were running an anti-racism group in our town in Connecticut at the time for a couple of years. So we always were having like these race discussions and white supremacy standards for living. And yeah. um, he w- one of the things that he was taught, we were talking about beauty culture in general and how like the white male patriarchal lens is really what's defined, what's beautiful. And even Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, one of my clients just told me they had a documentary that just came out recently on Netflix. And they are quoted as saying the really the epitome of beauty is a 15 year old, white, tall, slim woman. Mm, 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 mm. So when we are engaging what beauty is to be 15 years old, there's something real left up, but that aside, so it's, it's fascinating because he was, he and I were always dissecting. He's like, the standards here are so disgusting. He's like, so his wife, after having their second baby, she obviously had all these stretch marks on her stomach. And he said, it's one of the most beautiful things about her. Because every time I see them, not only do I think of my children, I think of what a warrior she is, her body is, every woman is. The fact that human existence would cease if women decided to stop having babies. So when he sees stretch marks, his lens tells him power, warrior. Through white supremacy lens, patriarchal, we say, Ooh, that's ugly. Go get that fixed. Get that lasered off. Do you have some cream you can put on that? You should probably only wear a one piece. Don't show that. Yeah. Hide it. And I won't have it. I won't have that. Yeah. It's so insulting to me that women get boiled down to pieces and parts. Mm. You are, I mean, you know, and it's interesting, even in what you're saying, it really has this underneath it is this aspect of shame. And that you yeah. have to hide something and I have to, Oh, it like makes me want to cry. Actually, just even I, I, I don't, you know, today's I've done a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work, a lot of years of <laughs> inner work, but I know that feeling in the past and thank God today I'll wear whatever the heck I want. I mean, I'm not, yes. you know, I, so whatever, sometimes it's a one piece, sometimes it's not, but I'm like, it's for me, it's whatever I love the colors, but the, the stand, I think what we're saying and what you're really saying is it's you know, it's, it's moving past and letting go and saying like effort to shame and to hiding any part of yourself and that there's anything 
quote unquote, even wrong. Like it's just, that's been that programming. And there is a big shift, I will say in the body positivity and you're seeing more models of all sizes. I mean, I was in Target the other day um, with my daughters, whenever, I don't know why it was just fun to like go to Target sometimes for no reason. I mean, I love, there's some other, I love all different places, but it's fun. And I was like, oh my God, look at all the, the, the mannequins, but those models are you know, I'm like, oh my God, they, they're my hips. I see them up there finally. And some yes. of that is changing. Um, I think we should do some midlife modeling, Amanda, and anyone Girl. listening, come join us. I think we should start a, <laughs> a I'm telling modeling. you, I'm yeah. telling you, that is on my list of things. It's so funny because I think about brands like some of the big brands, right? Like Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Chanel and Christian Dior. And I think it's so fascinating to me that they use like prepubescent models yeah. practically because those girls can't afford anything. What they actually, and I've thought about, I always think about like writing this letter. I'm like, who you actually need to be showcasing for those brands is women in midlife because we actually now have the spending capacity to come and purchase an item from your store. But it's, it, it doesn't feel like it's for us anymore when it's on, you know, girls who are in there. 15. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I, yeah. I, I always joke, I say to my husband, I'm like, so I'm going to be a holdout for a little bit longer, but I'm telling you if Gucci or Chanel or Louis Vuitton, or one of them don't approach soon, I'm starting my own female modeling, like thing agency. It's going to be all the women in midlife and beyond because wow. it is time to showcase. That's the other thing we don't have. We don't have that role model to look to, to be like, oh, okay, that's what it gets to look like. That's what it gets to be like. Um, and so we need more, we talk about representation in so many other ways. We need representation of what it actually looks like to yeah. be a woman beyond 40. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the honoring and the, um, the really celebrating of your smile lines of everything, of all yes. of it. I I'm very lucky. And I was, I'm raised by a mother who, um, and it's funny because, you know, I found myself like, Hey mom, do you want to maybe put on some cream or something? She does not care at all. She is like, I love every single wrinkle. I've earned every single line. It is. I mean, she really, for those who know my mom and, and you, you would love her. She really legit like embraces it. And there've been times I kind of was like, you sure you want to embrace it like that? And I'm, I'm, I'm not thrilled with myself for that, but you know, I have to say it is, it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. Um, she, she's like, I earned that. I earned that smile line. I earned that. I I'm 79, you know, I earned everything I have here. And I was like, damn, that's really empowering. So yeah. Little Julie, that, that is so. amazing that yeah. you had a role model like that. That's yeah, absolutely like that. incredible. Yeah, she is. I'll give a little shout out to my mom, Helene Riesler. If you're listening, she listens. She's, uh, oh. yeah. yeah, she is like that, but that's, we, you know, more women. And I, this is what I love about you and what the work you're doing and goodness, the message that you're, that you're really committed to. And I think, as you said, Amanda, you, you know, anyone listening, you can do this. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes that willingness. It takes yeah. the willingness um, and just starting where you are and we'll have your, all of your information. Cause I know people are going to want to connect with you. And I got to say like, girl, you are just, you, you feel like a, a soul sister and just someone I'm so grateful to be connected mm -hmm. and, and to be here in conversation with, I love what you are standing for and mm -hmm. you're a beautiful, real representation of what it's like to, to, to just age with grace and with mm -hmm. love. And as you said, choose love you know, not fear. So powerful. Mm, Julie, thank you so much for having me today. I too, from the time we met, I'm like, oh, we are so meant to be in conversation. And the fact that I am on your podcast right now and you were on mine several weeks ago, which aired yesterday. It's just like this, it's just incredible. So thank you very much for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. I have one last quick thing before we're like wrapping. And then I have, so I always say, I forgot to ask you, they're called heart flares. I'm so sorry. As we're wrapping, I'm like, my intuition is like, just ask her. So a heart flare is where there's that, like, I didn't ask you a question there. I just feel like there might be one thing left that you wanted to share that's there. That's a heart flare for you. So I know everyone, I'm the worst at saying goodbye. I hate saying goodbye. My husband <laughs> always laughs. He's like, you do not say goodbye. Well, so we're just going to give you one more <laughs> moment if there's anything that's in your heart that you feel like you want to I love know. that a heart flare I think that the the only other thing I would say is in all of this that we just shared and spoke about what it really boils down to 
is intimacy with ourselves, like really getting intimate with ourselves um, and our humanity is what all of this work is about. All of the work that I teach in regards to embodiment and freedom and love over fear, it truly is intimacy with self so that then we can actually do intimacy with others. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Love that. I just heard that quote. I think it's it's Gandhi's quote. It's like, be the change you wish to. It's like, be, yes. be intimate with yourself. The intimacy you want to see in the world, you, you know, find that first within. A million percent. Yeah. A million percent. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. What a gift. Yay. Thank and you just, so much. Oh, my gosh. And I want to, I just want to thank everyone for listening. And, you know, there's so many takeaways in my my suggestion, my encouragement, my uh, invitation is to really see how willing you are to to really to really tune in to what Dr. Amanda talked about and to just start with how can you be more intimate, more loving with yourself and to honor wherever you are, wherever you are in your life uh, and to, to just see it as a gift and be in the moment, be present. And so thank you, USG listener. Thank you for being here. We love you. Here's to you being free and your USG always. Mwah.